you absolutely have to decentralize in order to generate the right information to design programs as well as to make the service providers accountable. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. My name is Tim Phillips. The emergence of nation states and modern empires as well created highly centralized administrations and bureaucracies. But in the last 30 years, many governments have embarked on the opposite process, decentralization. But what do we mean by decentralization? How well has it worked so far? And what do we know about the right and the wrong way to deliver decentralized interventions? In 2006, Dilip Mukherjee of Boston University literally wrote the book. Well, he edited it anyway on decentralization. And he's also a contributor to a new anthology on a topic that's published by LSE Press. He joins me now, Dilip. Welcome to Vox Dev Talks. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Dilip, can we start at the opposite end? Centralization. Why was that such a powerful movement? What are the benefits of centralization for a country that's developing? Yeah, I think you have to go back to, uh, you know, the late 1940s, early 1950s, when the third world was emerging. A lot of underdeveloped countries were gaining independence from the colonial powers, and they were greatly affected by the history of their own experience under colonialization, as well as what they saw during the Great Depression, the collapse of market economies. And they were extremely impressed by Russia's achievements under Stalin to industry. Uh-huh at an extremely fast pace, literally in the course of 12 to 15 years. Russia was the country that stood up to Nazi Germany. The emerging new ideology in the late 1940s was that market economies don't function very well on certain dimensions, especially if you want to industrialize and develop a country quickly. And the emphasis was on macroeconomic coordination as well as resource generation. And the perception was that a country steeped in poverty would not by itself generate the resources required or have the skills or had the market institutions that would enable markets to deliver development at that point. Mm -hmm. So the state would have to adopt the commanding heights. You know, that was the kind of Russian jargon (laughs) and the Mm -hmm. five-year plans and all that. So that's where centralization came from. And it's an ideology that stuck. There was also mistrust of international trade. There was so-called export pessimism emanating especially from Latin America. So it was not just poor-income countries, but middle-income countries as well. And there was this consensus in terms of some kind of a mixed road. And that essentially went along with highly centralized programs of fiscal as well as industrial development. But what did they find out from this that centralization was not doing? What did it not provide? About 30, 40 years went by, and then the developing countries found themselves in the throes of a debt crisis, and thereafter, and forced to go to the IMF for all kinds of emergency stabilization programs, and then the fall of the Berlin Wall and all that. So that was a time when ideology was changing and swinging back in favor of the market. And at the same time, I think the experience with 40 years of centralization was that it was not responsive, it was not accountable. It was not well-informed. Essentially, development programs were top-down, dictated by central government ministries Mm -hmm. through a bureaucracy that was appointed by ministers in the central government in a remote capital and answerable only to them. And these guys were outsiders to local communities. And so there tended to be a one-size-fits-all mentality in terms of the design of programs, which were not in tune with local needs. So that was an information problem. And then there was this other accountability problem. If a bureaucrat didn't deliver what local citizens wanted, there was no mechanism by which even that would be known because their masters were the politicians or the high-level bureaucrats in the capital of the country who had no information available about performance. So they couldn't evaluate them even if they wanted to. But quite often, the system also became highly corrupt. Mm -hmm. And bribes kind of escalated all the way up to the top. And so there was a built-in inertia against any kind of change in the system. But it was clear that programs were not delivering the expenditures that governments were incurring, huge expenditures, especially when it came to social expenditures and local infrastructure. So yes, there was some industry building and some savings mobilization, yes. But 
the spending on social services and human development, therefore, was abysmal. The system was highly corrupt. So these were the failures that caused everybody to rethink. And decentralization emerged in the 80s and the 90s. Also as a reaction, as it happened, the, my 2006 book explains, it was also a reaction to military. Some of these regimes were highly non-democratic. Mm. That in America, you see Brazil and Argentina and the military regimes collapse, the same in Indonesia. You see apartheid collapse in South Africa. And so it was really the need for a resurgence of democracy. And local citizens had felt that they had been exploited by elites in the center. So it was partly a resurgence of democracy itself, part of which is local democracy. So all this was feeding into this new wave of decentralization, and it was embraced by the World Bank. The World Development Report in 2004 was devoted entirely to this issue, and it was called Making Services Work for the Poor. Mm -hmm. And the main theme was that you absolutely have to decentralize in order to generate the right information, to design programs, as well as to make the service providers accountable. Is it easy to put a definition on it? Is there a, an easy rule for what decentralization is? No. <laughs> <laughs> the devil is in the details. Yeah, so there are many different types of decentralization. You can decentralize health but not uh, transport, for instance. So it varies by sector. There is an administrative dimension to devolution. There is a political dimension to decentralization. Mm. So in my book, I classified the uh, 12 case studies that we examined into three types. There was one which combined economic and political decentralization. And examples were South Africa, Indonesia, and Bolivia. There were countries that focused on political decentralization, but very little in terms of economic decentralization. And examples were Brazil and India. Mm -hmm. And then there were countries where there was no political decentralization at all. It was entirely an administrative decentralization. And these tended to be non-democratic, authoritarian, centralized governments like China, Uganda, Pakistan. So there are these three different kinds of decentralization <laughs> that were happening at the same time. If I'm a policymaker in 2023, why might I be thinking that decentralization is particularly relevant now? We have now 30 years of experience with decentralization and different yeah. variants of decentralization. And innumerable studies have been made. So there is the benefit of that learning. And we have learned the extent to which decentralization has actually delivered on mm. it, the hope and the hype in the 1990s when it started. So that's one. And there is some disappointment. Two other issues. I think one is the arrival of information technology that provides central governments with more information better information about what's happening at the micro level, about individual citizens, about local communities. So in terms of the informational advantage of decentralization, that aspect, that benefit of decentralization has lessened. Decentralization has also generated different kinds of problems of accountability, and it provides a potential for what is now called recentralization, mm -hmm. an opportunity to perhaps rely on big data. Yeah as well as new instruments of you know, financial transfers using mobile phones and bank accounts and growing financial literacy of the population, where a government can make direct transfers to individual citizens, just as in a welfare state in Western Europe or social security in the United States. That capability is beginning to appear, and there is this promise of, at one stroke, generating the information using big data, as well as getting rid of all the accountability problems by going to formula-bound programs of transfers. And finally, I think sustainable development and gender empowerment are also kind of on the agenda for development nowadays that it wasn't quite as important, you know, in the 1990s. And I think there are all kinds of reasons why the successful design and implementation of sustainable development and empowerment programs have to be localized in a particular way. And so it also calls for a rethinking of decentralization, how well it has performed on those dimensions. One of the previous conversations I had about this with, with Nancy Chan, who was talking about the experience of the Chinese government, when the government decentralized power during the 1980s because it lacked the capacity to govern the entire Chinese state at the time, the end of that story was, and this is a spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't listened to that episode yet, was that as 
China developed, the government then took back the power. It re-centralized the power that it had devolved. Is this inevitable? Do policymakers tend to think about decentralization as a, a temporary state? Well, I think the dust is, won't even say that the dust is yet to settle. It's, it's a question that's just newly emerging. Yeah, It's too early to tell. Mm -hmm. And part of the purpose of my chapter in the forthcoming Faguet and uh, Paul volume on decentralization is exactly to start thinking about this question in the light of what evidence we have so far, which is very limited. But I can see this question looming on the horizon as becoming really big and important in the years to come. You have written in this book about decentralization of transfer programs. When uh, we have covered on Vox Dev Talks transfer programs in the past, normally the model has been some local experiment, which we then think about delivering nationally from a central authority. Is that still the default way in which we think about transfers? Oh, no, no, not at all. So first, let me clarify, by the word transfer, some people mean income transfers, which is mm -hmm. money transfers. But it turns out that the vast bulk of transfers are in-kind transfers in developing countries. So one question is cash versus in-kind. That's one question. But the other question is, well, how are these transfer programs managed? And they could be either decentralized or centralized. I think almost as a matter of default, because of the lack of information and the lack of financial literacy, by default, countries that did want to implement wide-ranging transfer programs had to devolve the authority because they simply didn't know. So, for instance, if you just go into a village in India, for instance, mm -hmm. and try and ask someone, okay, who are the people in this village? Where do they live? Do they live in a house? What are their occupations? What's the size of their household? Basic things like that, that you would need to know how to calibrate transfers properly. Nobody has that information. Mm. That information resides in an informal way with the local community heads or the local government chiefs. So now it's very difficult for the central government to decide if you, let's say, create a jobs program, who in that village should be working in that jobs program. They don't even have a list of names. So you just have to let the local leaders decide that. Almost by default, it's been decentralized. I think what big data is doing is they're doing these nationwide surveys, household surveys, and getting a roster. So in adding to the census, which mainly contains demographic information, you want to add economic information, which will give you an idea of how well off they are economically. Mm -hmm. And that information is just beginning to be collected in some countries. The two countries that I describe in my chapter are Indonesia and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. They've actually created a nationwide, in fact, Indonesia is still in the process of constructing it, doing this. It's called a proxy means test survey, where they go in and ask each and every household in the country a list of 46 assets they may or may not have and use that data to decide eligibility because they use that to estimate poverty and they try and decide who is poor and who's not. And it's only these two countries that have managed to create that database and then base a transfer program on that information. But most of the countries don't even have that. So it's just a weak state capacity that has, by default, caused transfer programs to be, by and large, decentralized. It's uh, very exciting, the opportunity to be able to capture this data, but then that has to be used in the delivery of effective programs. And one of the things that you mentioned in your chapter is the problem for decentralization of elite capture. We, you just mentioned the local elites. Is there potentially a problem that decentralization replaces a remote national bureaucracy elite with a, a local elite that's really not much closer to the people who are deserving of what the programs can deliver. Oh, absolutely. In fact, a large part of the disappointment with decentralization mm -hmm. has been this awareness of local elite capture, replacing capture by distant centralized elites. You have to compare which of the two evils, which is the lesser one. There are literally a thousand papers that have been written on this question. The evidence is extremely mixed. In some contexts, you find decentralization performing better. In others, it's been the other way around. And quite often, the explanation has been sought in terms of the vulnerability of a particular community to local elite capture. And it does have significant explanatory power. 
local elite capture tends to be greater, where traditions of civic and political participation, especially amongst the poor, is low, mm. and there is a lot of high socioeconomic inequality, and when these places are remote. And theory tells us that. That's what we should expect. And that's where decentralization would perhaps be the worst of the two evils. And that's exactly what the research finds. So the experience with decentralization has been extremely heterogeneous. It's very hard to say what has been the impact of decentralization. That's not the right question to ask is what we have learned in the last 25 years. It's a question of under what conditions will it do better or worse? And can we do something about those conditions? So there are ancillary reforms that sometimes will enhance the performance of decentralization. What can we do? Do we have any models, examples of where local administrations have been able to discipline those elites successfully? Actually, very few. Those local mechanisms you might think could be oversight committees. They could be either some kind of audit mechanisms where higher level governments send audit teams, or you have bottom up some kind of a grassroots monitoring. And many countries have tried both in tandem. And I think the elites are quite successful in subverting <laughs> either kind of oversight mechanism. So the evidence tends to show that this is really a very, very persistent and pernicious phenomenon, and that's very hard to tackle structurally. One other problem that you point out is the related but distinct problem of clientelism at a local level. What is the distinction between elite capture and clientelism? So clientelism refers to a situation where local political elites so these are the guys who are in the local government, they've won an election, and they're worried about the next election, and they have competitors. And so it, for them, it's really important how many votes they're going to get in the next election. And they essentially engage in a kind of implicit quid pro quo with voters. I give you benefits or transfers, in return you vote for me. And it's this mutual reciprocity, which is essentially a, an entrenched kind of corruption. However, since this is a trade of benefits for votes, it tends to happen with greater frequency with people who tend to respond more with their votes. And those are poor people. Mm -hmm. So there is this term that is used in Indian sort of media quite often called vote banks. So political parties develop these vote banks. You know, they have all these intermediary brokers who mobilize votes through this very selective treatment. You know, if you vote for me, I'll shower you with benefits. If you don't vote for me, I'll punish you in all kinds of ways. Those carrots and sticks is essentially what enables the incumbent to perpetuate their power. The difference is that this is often pro-poor. It creates a bias in favor of the poor. But right now, if they trust somebody, who gives them something right now. So there's a bias in favor of cash handouts or jobs that's going to generate incomes right away. So all kinds of short-term recurring benefits, cheap loans, things like that, loan forgiveness and so forth which is not going to generate much long-term improvement in their living conditions. So poor family, the principal earning member dies, then the party comes in and helps with the funeral, okay? It takes mm -hmm. care of you when you're down, but it's not ever going to lift your standard to a higher level in a permanent way. And it's sometimes to their advantage to keep people trapped in that state of vulnerability. The poor sometimes benefit from clientelism in a way they do not from elite capture because they're at least getting some benefits. But on the other hand, even amongst the poor, all kinds of distinctions are made based on ethnicity and political affiliation, which is intrinsically unfair. And of course, the whole thing is deeply corrupt. Both are similar in that it, they lower accountability of local governments because the government succeeds in elite capture simply because of the power of the local elites that ensures that they get elected time and again, and in the case of clientelism, by creating these vote banks. Let's look ahead at the prospects for decentralization. As you say, the evidence so far has been distinctly mixed. Are we getting any closer to guidelines, a sort of a, a recipe for how to do decentralization well? Or is it the type of problem that is so context dependent that we might never get to that? No, I think we have some understanding of the conditions under which it works well. By and large, I think the consensus is that decentralization works on average hmm. if it's well designed and so is something to be encouraged. However, it has to be designed carefully. It has to be comprehensive. 
which means that it should be a combination of political and economic decentralization. It should be a de facto decentralization rather than only in paper. And there are many instances of decentralizations that have not really been implemented properly. There's an intermediate layer quite often of regional governments, state governments, that have to devolve power to local governments. And so even though the central government gives up its power, the local, the state governments are unwilling to devolve power to the local government. Yes. And so part of the reason why in Brazil and India, the decentralization was halting and mixed was precisely because of the power of the regional governments. The center quite often is trying to impose mandates on the state governments, but the state governments are sort of dragging their feet in terms of implementing it. And for instance, in terms of financial authority, often the resources given to local governments is so pitifully small that they can't really do anything with that money. And they keep needing to run to not the central capital, but now to the state capital. And nothing has really changed. So there's that kind of a problem to actually make it a functioning decentralization. And then the way that elections, local elections happen and the extent of resources that the state puts in to ensure that they are free and fair elections, there's a considerable amount of effort that's involved there and expenditure. So that's important. Whether elections are allowed for political parties to participate or not, whether there is a functioning civil society that provides some kind of oversight mechanism, a lot of this depends on deep historical and cultural attributes of local communities. We know conditions where underlying distribution of assets and social power is not too unequal. That's important. Regions of high inequality, probably the local elites will manage to subvert the institution Mm -hmm. and actually benefit from decentralization at the expense of the larger community. We know where we expect it to work and where it may not work so well. And maybe a judicious combination of stronger safeguards in areas where it's not likely to work so well, combined with long-term programs to reduce inequality. Economic inequality is very important. So within India, you see that states which have carried out land reforms have succeeded in implementing decentralization more successfully essentially because that reduced the extent of elite capture. So if you complement decentralization with a land reform, that's kind of a complementary institution. So there are all kinds of ways in which you can bundle decentralization with other political and economic reforms that can make it more successful. There have been also been programs for reserving seats in local governments for women or for minority groups, ethnic minority groups. And I think we have now experience for the last 30 years that they work in giving voice to minorities. You've told about your optimism for how big data can help. What sort of state capacity is needed to be able to generate and use this data? So one is the proxy means test. Hmm. You need to be able to carry out a proxy means test, but that's only the first step. The second step is then you have to create a system that can administer the transfers once you decide on some kind of a formula. Mm -hmm. And that is not easy. So one of the projects I'm currently engaged in is understanding the rollout of the Pakistan. Uh, It's called the Benazir Income Support Program, which was based on this proxy means test nationwide data. And the whole process of rolling out took place from 2011 to, I'd say, 2016, 2017. Along the way, there are many hiccups. I mean, even in the United States, I believe when Social Security was rolled out, it took 15 years to get the administration right. Obamacare was being rolled out in the U.S. just 10 years ago. The first two years, the computer systems were all failing. You know, nobody could get through and so forth. So there are lots of administrative glitches. And you can imagine what it will be like in a, in a less developed country. So that's kind of a second prerequisite. A third prerequisite is for people to understand what their entitlements are. You need a nationwide identification card system verifying, you know, the beneficiary is who he is or who she is. So you need to develop this whole citizen identification cards and you need verification technologies. So that is a third step. And you need people to be financially literate. So people have to have a bank account or a mobile phone. Some of the most vulnerable people in poor countries have neither. What kind of access mechanism will you have for people who are not included in the formal financial system. These are very, very challenging questions that I think developing countries with weak state capacity will have to face. Something that comes up throughout this book is that clash between systems of rules and the need for discretion. It's implicit in decentralization that there will be some introduction of discretion. Is there ever going to be a simple model where we can think about what's subject to rules and where discretion sits. Is this a problem that is particularly hard to solve? 
Decentralization does not mean that local governments just disappear. It is only about private transfer programs that we are talking about. But there's a whole range of other services involving local infrastructure, public health, for which you will continue to need local governments. The role of local governments would then be exclusively focused on local public goods. Right now, it's a combination of administering transfer programs and local public goods. But that's exactly how you see local government structured, let's say, in Western Europe or the United States. So that's kind of going to be a shift of the definition of what local governments are going to do. And so obviously, there's a lot of need for discretion in the administration of local infrastructure. I mentioned earlier sustainable development, for instance. I'm working on a project on restoring watersheds in central India. And as I work with these teams that are on the ground, these are NGOs, I begun to appreciate how important it is that this has to be delegated to local communities. There's just no way a centralized authority would be able to carry this out. Mm -hmm. It has to be a combination of central and decentralized initiative. The central government would have to identify areas where these programs are important and fund them, but then the actual execution and implementation has to be left to the local community. So that's local infrastructure. But then when we come back to transfers, there are also all kinds of potential disadvantages of a purely formula-bound system. One is that the quality of the database of the central government may be imperfect, always is imperfect, and so there may still be scope for including some scope for discretion at the local level. And this is particularly important when it comes to providing insurance against local shocks. There could be local weather shocks or maybe even all kinds of accidents or emergencies at the household level, which would be very difficult for a central authority to be aware of and build in to the design of a program. Ideally, I'm saying, there would be a value for some discretion. And this is a topic of current research that I discuss in my chapter. What do we know about how well do local governments provide insurance against local shocks? And finally, there is a political problem, which is that it changes the balance of power, political power, between whichever party is controlling the central government and whichever political groups are dominant elsewhere in the country. And worldwide, we are seeing a tendency towards national authoritarian governments and a threat to democracy. So I think my deepest worry about decentralization is that it would increase the power that the central government would have. Even if there were a formula, and a really good one, devised by economists, would the central government actually abide by it or would it find ways to manipulate it? Mm -hmm. And if so, what are the safeguards? These are very difficult, but incredibly important questions. Thank you for shining some light on to what we know about this and also what we still do not know in the research that's being done. Dilip, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. The book that we have been discussing is called Decentralized Governance, Crafting Effective Democracies Around the World, published in 2023 by Alice Press, and the editors are Jean-Paul Faguet and Salmbista Pal. Dilip's earlier book it was called Decentralization and Local Governance in Developing Countries, A Comparative Perspective, published by MIT Press in 2006 with the editors Pranab Bardan and Dilip Mukherjee. This has been a VoxDev Talk. The best way to make sure you don't miss an episode is to subscribe. You find us wherever you get your podcasts. And our past episodes, as always, are at voxdev.org, where you will also find articles about the papers, in this case, the books that we feature.